And the way this normally works is there are microphones, I think, on each stairwell. Um, in the absence of a question, I've got a couple here, but firstly, open to the floor, given we haven't got long. Are there any initial questions from the floor for any of our three speakers? No, let me kick off. Yes, sorry, please. Can you turn this thing on? It's on. Uh, Francis Bright, Northern Territory Department of Primary Industry and Fisheries. I'm the economics leader. Luke, I really liked your talk. I support your view that um, cost-benefit analysis doesn't cut it. Traditional analysis falls out after 20 years. When you're talking about an Asian culture, they might have 300. And with Indigenous people, they have at least 40,000. So Benny cost it. We need to improve it. We need to change the way we think. My question really is to the first speaker who mentioned that there were some limitations in Northern Australia and why he didn't pick land tenure as probably the major issue in Northern Australia for development into intensive irrigated agriculture. Thank you for your uh, question. My talk, the topic was focused on market opportunities. I uh, didn't go into the limitations or resource constraints of Northern Australia, but ABS has done a study, uh, I think it's about two years ago, my branch, uh, did a study on northern cattle industry and we look at a number of issues. Uh, issue of land tenure is also in lengthy discussion in that paper. So if uh, any uh, delegates interest uh, uh, in uh, our study and look at what we've been saying about uh, possible infrastructure issues and uh, institutional issues and so on, you're welcome to download a copy of the research report from our website. But I just would like to say the topic I'm presenting uh, is on the uh, market opportunities and my message is uh, uh, very simple. Uh, we think uh, there will be significant market opportunities that can benefit Northern Australia but investment is needed and certain constraints needs to be overcome. Thank you. I've got a question for you, Georgia, um, without notice. Um, I was fascinated about, with your presentation about the practical application of foreign investment and what that's done for your business up north. And I'm involved in something called Grow North, which is about trying to lower the barriers to investment in the north. The argument being that the North has been capital starved over the last 150 years, but you've already done it. So I'm just wondering whether you can give us some of the insights about how you succeeded so well and how we could take that thinking through to the broader development of the North and the part private capital, both domestically and internationally, can play in that. Well, I, would, I wouldn't say I've done it to any <laughs> great degree, but thank you very much, Michael. Um, on, on a side note there, I agree with Luke, absolutely. I think Grow North is extremely important needs to be uh, supported, needs its funding, it's very important to the northern development. Um, I think uh, with regards to the development of the north, uh, every, every bit of development has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I don't think it's a, a holus bolus approach. Um, I think we, we need to look at uh, specific pockets and areas and, and build those up first because one of the huge problems we've got with uh, northern Australia is the lack of infrastructure with regards to particularly um, when you're looking at smaller farms or agriculture, uh, power resources, roads. You've seen Luke's photos of our road infrastructure. Uh, it took me 13 hours to drive to Darwin. It usually takes me eight. Um, and that's because it's the wet season. It was pretty exciting getting out on the access road because we'd had a bit of rain. Um, I think uh, one of the things we, we need to remember is Overseas countries are doing the same kind of research and studies we are. They are aware of what they need to as they grow. That, um, they, are, they are aware that they do not have the capacity to supply themselves, so they will be looking for opportunities. What we need to make sure we are doing is we are there and ready to embrace those opportunities and also use them for the best benefit 
of uh, not only individuals but Australia as a whole. Thank you, George. Any more? Yes, we have one over here, please. Uh, Jim Prattley, Charles Sturt University. Yeah, if I could ask uh, Luke Bowen, thank you for your talk. It's terrific uh, to hear that firsthand. Um, two quick questions. One is, what would be the first thing politically uh, acceptable, uh, take for granted, uh, the first thing that ought to be done, you know, in terms of infrastructure? And I guess the second one is the white paper on Northern Australia. What are the expectations that are coming out of that? Will it um, yeah, no, thanks. Very good question. Uh, I think the, um, ultimately it's about enabling infrastructure and we, we acknowledge, I think, that we have to get a mix between uh, private investment and public investment and that's sometimes where the challenge is. It's often expected that you can do it all with private money. And when you, when you talk about public infrastructure, which is some of that enabling stuff around roads, for example, ports, rail, uh, you need to have significant um, public investment in it. So having a plan to do that's not a bad start. Uh, projecting what that might look like is not a bad start. Uh, we tend to run political cycles, unfortunately, around some of this sort of stuff, uh, without sounding too cynical. Uh, but having a plan and having the, the guts, the guts to push yourself out a bit further, is is I think a critical thing. Um, sending positive signals to bi to business and to industry uh, and to other countries and other investors is critical. S signals that we are consistent, that we are reflective, and we are trying to secure peace of mind for people who are thinking about or actively engaged in business in our country, whether they be Australians or otherwise. Um, positive, consistent signals are really important. And I know that you know, we can often draw on things that have happened uh, in the past, and I have some personal experience, and, and as others have had with, uh, in, the, in the livestock sector, where we, we sent some fairly um, abrupt signals that weren't received particularly well. And that sort of stuff, we can't allow that sort of thing to happen. But more it's about a lot of policy around land tenure, as Francis mentioned before, a lot of our land in the north is still bound up in pastoral lease or Aboriginal land, and we're not, in some cases, being flexible enough around how we view that, how we can use it, how we can secure water uh, so that people know they've got it, know they can use it, uh, even if they have to pay for it. But you need to be able to send positive, consistent signals, otherwise people get spooked. Uh, and it's not surprising, because Every country has its idiosyncrasies, and we certainly have them. Thank you, Luke. Um, George, with that pick on you, know, I've got another one for you. Um, you mentioned the day-to-day -day operations around the property have not changed since the change in ownership, um, but you have money to invest in things like infrastructure. One of the concerns I hear is about losing control over major investment decisions as an argument against foreign um, investment. How much control do you have over those major investment decisions in the early part of working for the Indonesians? Well, admittedly, our situation might be to a certain degree unique, um, but we've been fully involved, Michael and I, the whole way through with Santori. Um, they're a great company to work for, they really are, and I'd have to say they're pretty progressive. Uh, they, and admittedly, it may be a unique situation, uh, they were buying a set up, running, operating, very successful cattle business, so they knew they were getting something. They didn't have to put a huge amount of resources in. We had, as I said, already a five-year plan going forward with what we'd like to do with money, which being pastoralist, you don't have a lot of money. Um, and that is one of the reasons, as I keep saying, that I think foreign investment's so important. But um, we were very, very able, easily able to lay out uh, a budget and what we wanted to do. And if you can show anyone the benefits of doing those improvements, then they're willing to spend the money. So yes, we, we did the budgets with, with Santori Senior Management and then have been implementing them. Please. Hi, uh, hi Rick Sinclair from Forest and Wood Products Australia. Um, a question to the panel. In terms of the three jurisdictions in the north, West Australia, NT and Queensland, is there any degree of coll collaboration and cooperation between the jurisdictions? Is that, or is it fairly competitive in terms of chasing investment? And are the intergovernment structures appropriate for uh, get attracting investment to the region? Um, that a good question. And before I go on, the previous question about the white paper was—I didn't answer that. Um, not entirely sure, um, but it's been pushed out, and I think uh, we'll have to watch that space. 
about the white paper, but uh, you know, I think March or f April, might, my judgment of it would be given what still has to happen. It, I th can't see it happening before then. Um, going to the question about the three jurisdictions, I think the white paper process has been an interesting one because what it actually has done is actually put some formal structure around it. So the Prime Minister and the, the, th the three Premiers, now minus Campbell Newman, um, hopefully plus the new Premier of Queensland formed a strategic partnership which is about driving some of that northern development um, and the discussion between jurisdictions. So the, the structure is there. Working groups that the government have put together in each of those jurisdictions to cooperate are there and have done some quite good work. So um, it really, it's, it's ultimately going to come down to rubber hits the road and that's, that means there has to be there has to be some rubber hitting the road, there has to be some, some fair income signals coming through that this is real uh, and that the, our, our, our policy makers think it's real and want to commit to it longer term. Uh, we always run the risk of having a very um, disappointed, cynical sort of response if, if things don't end up flying and we don't see a commitment to something ultimately uh, that we need. People go, oh, yeah, there we go again. See, it's all been bullshit. So it's, it's really critical that that doesn't happen uh, and that means that, that we have to have a very solid uh, white paper and it has to be integrated with the other white papers that are going on. We've got agricultural competitiveness which has probably got a similar gestation. Um, uh, we've got taxation, federation, defence and a number of others which all have a strong bearing on Northern Australia. Some of them are, are a bit further out but certainly com agricultural competitiveness and the uh, Northern white paper are much closer to home, we hope. Thank you, Luke. And I might also add, from a Grow North perspective, we have eight founding partners or funders and putting it together, three of which are the jurisdictions of the North, and they're very supportive of a whole of North approach and working very closely together. So my experience in the bit over a year with Grow North has been a great one in terms of that working together and collaboration um, piece, for what it's worth. Sir. Hello. Uh, working. Uh, Phil Tickle from the CRC for Spatial Information. A question to Luke. Um, thank you very much for that. It was an inspirational talk and you've identified a whole range of uh, challenges that really require some new thinking um, and uh, I suppose you look at um, whole of government uh, sort of um, endeavours in other, other sectors, there's certainly some challenges in, uh, in, your, in your space. Just a question in terms of those, those challenges and, and taking new approaches and, and new thinking. Looking at other countries, have you um, sort of done a bit of a, bit of a um, sort of a, a scan of, of, of other countries and, and, and who's got it right? If you know, are we that different? Um, I, I'll, I'll say no. Um, not, not. Uh, we. I can't say that, that. I mean, there's a lot of work goes on picking bits and pieces in the eyes out of what's going on elsewhere. I mean, currently there's a big debate about unconventional gas, for example, looking at the way development's taken place in parts of America. Um, so there's, you know, supposedly a lot of learnings around that. It's not just about the economics and the practicalities and the on-ground stuff. It's about people and social stuff. Um, so I think there's a lot of there's a lot of cherry picking going on, trying to pick out. We often focus on the negatives, necessarily than the positives. Often, um, we often look at places like Brazil. Uh, a number of countries are doing exactly the same thing. China is going through this Western development uh, focus at the moment. Uh, even countries like England, you know, they, they have this revitalisation that takes place. So there's a lot to be learned, I think. My answer, is, my answer to your question is no, and I can't sit here and tell you inclusively what we should be doing based on what's happened in a number of these places, but we certainly get an insight into it. But just picking up on your area of expertise, that work is something that is critical. So sp getting the raw materials of some of these ingredients around success together, which is about water, land, uh, infrastructure, proximity, markets, ultimately we really need to be focusing on markets first, uh, is critical and a lot of it's underdone in the north. So we don't have a prospectus, somebody comes in from overseas and says what do you got mate? We don't have a thing, so look here you go, there's a great bit of dirt there, and another bit there and there's a bit of water there um, and there's a road there. We, we don't do that very well at the moment and that's part of what this northern work is, is also about, is actually building that, building that picture much more clearly. There's bits and pieces of it but it's not always particularly helpful. Um, you know, I know CSIRO have done some amazing work. It's, it's probably not, it's not public information because it's probably quite sensitive, but you know, they've got some amazing technology. You just drop water on the landscape and see where it pools and you keep putting more water on and seeing where it pools and where it flows and where you put a wall and a dam and, and all the rest of it to work out what you can do more creatively, not with big dams necessarily, but also with small dams um, and how you work that with, with um, off-stream water capture and, and harvest. Uh, we, we've got to be a lot smarter about what we do and, uh, in the space and there's not one size that fits all and it's not just always just about building a dam wall. Um, so I think your area of work is critical, absolutely critical. 
Hey, Dr. Jamie Pym, I've got a question for you. You talked in your presentation about profitability and competitiveness being critical to the future of the North. Do you have a sense from your data and trends about the two or three things we need to be most strongly focused on early in thinking about those twin challenges of profitability and competitiveness in Northern Australia? I think that uh, uh, there are a uh, wide scope of issues uh, that needs to be looked at when we're talking about competitive, competitiveness, uh, productivity, and so on. I think uh, uh, my fellow uh, panelists addressed a number of issues, such as uh, uh, infrastructure, which is very important. I also mentioned about uh, uh, capturing water and all that type of things. There are also issues not only relating to our domestic uh, productivity uh, increases, but also in terms of uh, marketing. That is, uh, imagine 20, 30 years down the track, and you can observe now in China and in other Asian countries that they are changing their uh, consumer purchasing uh, uh, habits. They are using more and more internet shopping. They go into supermarkets and all those things. Now, of course, if we want to take the growth opportunities in Asia, our uh, exporters will need to work very closely with the uh, supermarkets, the wholesalers, the retailers, in the Asian countries to establish a very good working relationship in the supply chain so that we can present our products, clean, green images directly to the consumers. So I think that there are two fronts. What we've been talking a lot is about infrastructure, domestic issues, and production capacity and all that type of things, but also marketing get our products into overseas markets in the form, in the presentable form that we wanted to present to our consumers and get the big bang for our buck is also very important. And clearly, that will become more important uh, in Asian markets because more and more internet shopping using hybrid markets, you know, going to the supermarkets. It's not just uh, a, a traditional sales that you go to the wet market and see the consumer buy, you know, the fresh products, you know, the kill of the day in the morning. So I think that uh, all those type of issues needs to be carefully taken into consideration in business planning so that we can take the full advantage of the growth opportunities in Asia. Thank you. And uh, look, the last question, Georgia, I left for you as the person who's done it on the ground, the practical um, person with a tremendous story to tell. We talk about this idea of lifting profitability and competitiveness. What, what do you think are the next tangible steps for Northern Australia in thinking about those two challenges? Well, we've all covered it, um, I think, obviously, Competitively at the moment, we don't have the resources to actually provide the infrastructure that we need to develop. I, I'm actually a big believer that as we saw Luke's amazing map with the circle on the globe, I'm a big believer that our customers will come to us first, where the, the nearest neighbours. We, we all know Australia can't provide everything they need, but I certainly believe that they will come to us looking for things. It's, uh, it is up to us to then know what we need to be able to supply them and to be able to work out a relationship which will enable that, those resources to be able to be supplied. And that we have to realise if we ask other people to put their money into Australia, they do need something back from that too. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that brings to a conclusion the session on opportunities for agriculture in Northern Australia. Can I ask you to join with me in thanking Dr Jamie Pem, Mrs Georgia Underwood and Mr Luke Bowen. <laughs>